connecting with the continent is another part of the healing. You can never be fully healed if you don't make that connection. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to live on the continent, but you have to at least make the connection and connect with with the motherland, or as in Burkina Faso, they call it the fatherland. Hey, what's good, everybody? Thank you very much for checking me out. As I said, Coach Simpson, I'm very, very, very privileged to be on your screens again. Uh, the conversation has now begun. I want to say thank you to all the uh, people that I have um, interviewed, you know, talking about Rio, Jenny, mm -hmm. and all other people that I've, I've, I have spoken to. Uh, today, I'm going to have my first gentleman on this conversation. I have here a gentleman who is, I'm saying a gentleman because what he is doing is for the youth. And he is a youth. Yes, what he's doing, uh, you, you will hear a lot from him and you will say that, whoa, do we have brothers who are so passionate about seeing that Africa is really developed? So uh, with that honor, I want to bring here uh, my boss. Boss, good, uh, <laughs> good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing perfect. You're a Rasta? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Most small. <laughs> Most small. Yeah, that is it. Now, uh, before we get on, I know you've watched a, a couple of my videos. We've also met one on one, I think two or three times when yep. we came to Ghana, yep. you know, looking at the best way we can collaborate and then build Africa together or Africans building themselves together. First of all, let us know you introduce yourself. And if you want to give shout outs to where you were born and raised, that would be good. Then we go from there. My name, well, my new name now is Nana Kwabena Ababio. Okay. I was renamed uh, in May when I was there in Ghana, in Bonri. And so, um, uh, but I'm from the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. I live on the Virginia side. Uh, for those who are familiar with the area, you know that Maryland, uh, D.C., and Virginia all kind of merge together. So I'm on the Virginia side of the D.C. metropolitan area. And so uh, originally from uh, the Midwest, from Kansas. Um, uh, and so I've um, lived in the D.C. area for uh, about close to 40 years. Uh, and so uh, it's been an amazing journey being here. Uh, I've had the privilege of working for four presidential administrations, uh, two Obama, and then uh, one George Bush, and then, then the two Obamas, and then part of um, Tr Donald Trump's organization for the State Department doing visa processing for the United States. So it was quite uh, an experience. Um, I retired um, about four and a half years ago from corporate America. So now my energy and my efforts are focused on Africa full time. Great. The energy is now focused on Africa full time. The question has always been, hey, when we're growing up, you know, through education, we were not given much knowledge, in-depth knowledge about Africa. How did Nanakwa Abebu got to know about Africa, and then you decided that if this is the Africa now I know, then I want to channel my energy, my focus to Africa, like you just said. It's an interesting story. So, uh, as you said, we didn't learn it in school. We didn't learn anything about Africa. Um, my experience with Africa came in my uh, in in real life, uh, mostly being here in DC when I moved here. I had a little exposure with some Ghanaians I'd met. Um, actually, no, pretty much here. It was, everything happened here. When I first moved here, I worked for a company that no longer exists today. It's called MCI. They were a long distance carrier. Uh, and I worked for them for about eight and a half years. Well, two, three years into that tenure, they transferred me to Colorado. And it was in Colorado where I first, uh, really interacted with Ghanaians. Now, prior to Colorado and and um, upon first moving here, my first roommate was continental African. He was from um, Ethiopia and we were roommates for about four years. And so that exposed me to, to continental African culture. And so that kind of set the stage. I didn't know that I would have this shift to West Africa as I have today, uh, but it wasn't until um, maybe about 14 years ago that I really, I connected with a family in Ghana and we clicked 
Uh, I built a relationship with that family. I had never been to Ghana at that point, but I had mm -hmm. met this family um, through another friend who is now a chief and he lives in Australia. And so he had a, um, several internet cafes in Tima in the surrounding area. And so he introduced me to this family. Uh, I clicked with that family and that family is the reason that I have had this 14 year relationship with Ghana. And so um, what I learned, I learned in, pretty much mostly in that 14 year period. Once I connected with that family, I started to, to, to try to figure out, okay, so why, why didn't I learn any of this in school? Uh, what is it? How do I need to know more? I need to understand what I'm doing. And so I, though the family was teaching me certain things, I wanted more than what they were giving me because our time together was limited. So I started to do research and started to find out. Um, and then I live in an area. So the D.C. metropolitan area where I live, it has the second largest Ghanaian population in the United States. The first is New York. Here is second. So there are tons of Ghanaians here. Um, and so, um, and then the city that I live in, in Virginia, for some reason, there are tons of Ghanaians in my city. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of Ghanaian restaurants. Um, I had, when I met that family 14 years ago, um, they convinced me to start a business in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So um, they lived in Tima. Um, and then I said, okay, um, let's do it. So I opened a little, uh, electronic store in Tima in community one, and it was right at the, the market and it, and you know, and you know how the market is set up, all the shops are inside, right? This, my shop was one of the only shops that faced outside <laughs> and, and, and it was a really, it was a tiny shop in comparison to shops here, but that shop had continuous business. The line would be down the street. I, I don't know if you know where the Zenith Bank is, but it was on that side. And so the line would be down the street with people wanting to get um, you know, their phones fixed or laptops fixed. Uh, we had small electronics too that we sold and that kind of thing. Uh, it was a big success, but what I did is um, I, I, we, we sold out of everything. We just couldn't keep stock right but what i did is i diverted those funds to something else and i i bought some property in kamasi so that was kind of the first property that i had and and even how i got that property the family that i befriended because i wasn't a Ghanaian citizen right mm -hmm. so you can't buy property without being having citizenship at that time it was it's a little different than it was than it is today but that family transferred an apartment they owned in Tima to my name so I could buy the property in Kumasi. Mm -hmm. And so that started me on a path that I had no clue was going to happen. And it just blew up. And I'm not going to tell you about that property right now. I'll tell you mm -hmm. about that the next time you interview me. Because <laughs> what's going on with that property has really, really um, put me in a, in, a, in a position where Ghana's good to me. <laughs> I know you know, you probably know Gina Ofori, right? She does the song about Ghana's good to me. I mean, Ghana is good to me. And so, um, so after that, um, I, I got the, the second property. All of these amazing things started happening. And, the, and things were happening. And I was like, this can't be. This can't mm -hmm. be real. I, you know, I, the people that I kept meeting, um, you may know. He's he's Ewe uh, from the Volta region, Peter Amawu. So Peter Amawu, so the land that I bought in Kamasi, Peter Amawu, he called my guy in the family in Ghana and said, hey, he said, I, your boss's paperwork came across my desk. He said, uh, give him my number. Tell him to call me. I'd like to talk to him. And so Abdul is the, the, the young man. He called me. He said, hey, he said, Peter, I'm who wants to talk to you. I said, really? And I didn't really know who he was. He mm -hmm. said, he's the, he's the minister of uh, land and natural resources. He wants to talk to you. I said, OK. He said, here's his number. So I called him. He said, hey, he said, ah, I see you live in Virginia, in Woodbridge. I said, yeah. He said, aha, 
He said, uh, I have a house in Woodbridge, Virginia. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, my children went to Woodbridge High School. I said, yeah, that's very close to where I live. He said, uh, he said, and my, my, uh, he said, a couple of my children are still there. So he said, what is it that you're trying to do in Ghana? And at that point, this was kind of like early on. So I hadn't really put a whole lot of thought into it. Um, and so I said, well, maybe I'd like to do some importing and exporting. I'd maybe bring some cars in. He said, uh-huh. He said, he said, well, the next time you come to Ghana, he said, come see me. He said, you have my number. He said, hit me up. And he said, let's, let's work on getting you set up. Right. And so, um, I have not connected with him since then, but, and I still plan to, I know he's, he moved from, from natural land and natural resources to energy. And of course, now that term is ending because Nana Kufuado is going out and whoever, Mahama, whoever is going to win is going to come in, but, but I'm going to reach out to him. But you know, that man gave me money. He gave me money for my project in Kamasi. And I was like, he said, tell your guy to come by and see me. He said, I want to give him some money to help you. And I said, really? And all the time, like I said, I kept having things like that happen. And it wasn't no small, small money either. I mean, for somebody you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then I, so, so I talked to the family about it. And they said, well, you know what, what's happening is he's not going to always be in office. And if you do business in Ghana, he's going to want to connect and be a part of whatever you're doing. And then he can also open doors for you if you run up against hindrances. And I said, ah, so I'm learning how the culture operates because mm -hmm. we don't operate like that here. Nobody would ever give you money like that. Right. Um, and then seldom do you have people who really give you a hand up to kind of help you out if you need it. So, uh, so I have that in my back pocket for right now and I'm going to use it. But since then I have all of these connections at the Tim Port. So I may not even need him, but I will go back to him because he was so kind to me. Mm -hmm. And so now that's a good story, right? There are some bad ones too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but. I choose to focus on the good and I didn't. And the bad happened before that good story happened. I had mm -hmm. a lot of bad happen before that one good story. But um, I knew that I was supposed to be connected with Ghana. Um, other than just a knowing. That's all I had to go on. I just felt I had never been to any African country before uh, when I started this. And then one day, uh, Abdul called me. I was actually in Canada on vacation. I was in Ottawa. I did a road trip and I drove all across Canada that year because I, I was like a three week, three week trip in by car. Um, and so while I was on that trip, Abdul called me, he says, you need to come to Ghana right now. I said, why? He said, just trust me, just come now. I said, I wish you'd have called me like two weeks ago before I planned this trip because mm -hmm. I didn't have a trip. And he said, do whatever you can do to come. So you know what? I ended my Canadian trip, came back home, booked the ticket and came to Ghana. And that was my first trip to Ghana. And um, so that's kind of how when when I came to Ghana, then Ghana became real. When I touched the ground, it was like, whoa, what is this? The The, the vibration that I felt and the connection that I felt was just so strong. And up until that point, I hadn't, though I had had the store in Tima, the electronic store, I had bought the land in Kamasi. I still really didn't connect until I came on that first trip. And that changed the trajectory of everything that I did going forward. The job that I had working for the State Department uh, requires what they call a clearance, a secret clearance. Mm -hmm. You have to go through this vetting process. Clearances are very expensive, uh, something like $100,000 per person. I had this clearance. And then with the clearance, the government doesn't allow you to do, like you cannot leave the country without telling them. And then to leave, you have to do go through this whole, you have to let them know a month in advance. You've got to, you got to tell them all oh, where, where you're going to be staying and who you're going to be staying with. And then once you get there, when you get back, you got to have a, 
debrief and you got to tell them who you were with and who you talked mm -hmm. with. So, and they're very invasive, right? And so when I bought that land, I ain't tell them shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, why, why you gotta be all up in my business, right? And so a friend of mine who was also who also worked for the government had a clearance. She said to me, she said, you know, you, you need to tell the government what you're doing because if they find out, you know, you lose your job. I said, no, I'm not telling them. Why do they need to know about my business? From that 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 initial trip, everything about my life and my work shifted. Everything, even when I came back home, uh, I think the Black Panther movie came out. I want to say later that year. Uh, I want to say that was 2017 or 2018. So when that movie came out, I mean, all I could think about was Ghana after I made that trip. Mm -hmm. But when that movie came out. I was so infatuated with it and I saw it several times and I said, you know what? I want to have a business and I, I want to try to see if I, if that name is available so I can reserve it. And, and, and so I looked in my state, the name was available. So I reserved the name, uh, Wakanda okay. enterprises, but I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just wanted to reserve it because I knew that if I didn't reserve it because the movie was so popular, somebody else would probably get it and I couldn't have that name. So I reserved it. So that was in 2018. Um, I just started using it three years ago when I came to Ghana and registered my business. But even though I registered it, it things still hadn't quite come together yet because one of the projects that I was doing, uh, I was waiting for my payday. And so it is, and a lot of things interfered with the payday. The first thing was the pandemic. Mm -hmm because everything got shut down. And then as soon as the pandemic was over, the war started. And then the war is still going on. So those factors prohibited my business from, or the, my payout from happening because my customer happens to be Russian. So, but we worked it out. Baby, payday is right around the corner, yo. <laughs> <laughs> So, interesting. So I'm ready. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, interesting story. Interesting story. I mean, um, you 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 gave it the thought to open your mind to trust the people of Ghanaians. You know, you 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 open your mind to say, even if I've not been there, it's what you want to do. And at the end of the day, I can see from your face and from your actions that you never regretted taking that decision to travel to Africa, Ghana to, to test the waters. Right, right, right. Well, you know, there's, there's so many. So interestingly, I, I, I'm going to back up a little bit. When I first moved to the DC metropolitan area, that again was my first interaction with continental Africans. Because where I, where I grew up, it was very white. I grew up in middle America and there were I, there were no Africans in my school, no continental Africans in my school. There were none in my circle. And so when I moved here, there were a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so my, um, uh, again, my, my first roommate was from Ethiopia. Uh, but when I moved here, there was a lot of animosity between continental Africans and African Americans. And I don't know why it is. The only thing that I could say is it's probably because the colonizer had already you know, they'd done their divide and conquer thing back in, in 1884. And so they were, they had fully, fully um, 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 exerted their plan into both continental African society and the African American community society, right? So they purposely did things to pit us against each other mm -hmm. because it was a part of their divide and conquer strategy. But we didn't know because we didn't really know anything about Africa. And so we, you know, a lot of African-Americans today think Africans live in trees. They think all Africans are barefooted. They don't know that Accra uh, is very well developed, you know, and granted, it's got some issues with some of the infrastructure, but for the most part, I mean, it's got pretty much every, anything you could get here, there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, same with, with in Lagos, it's, you know, it's, I've been to, four or five different African countries, but it's not what they told us it was, mm -hmm. but you'd never know if you didn't go. Right. 
And so there's a lot of money in Black America. Uh, Black America has about three trillion U.S. dollars of wealth. If Black America was a nation in and in, of itself, it would be the seventh largest nation in the world economically. That, that's pretty huge. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. And of course, Ghana has experienced it during the year of return, right? Mm -hmm. About a million of us showed up in Ghana for the year of return, bought something like $1.3 billion into Ghana's economy. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And so, and then of course, Nana Akufuado, he did the year of return and beyond because he, he saw how much money Black America had. So he's like, okay, mm -hmm. we need to tap into some more of that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but that wealth pretty much is from the Divine Nine, if you know who they who they are. No. So so the Divine Nine, that's the, the, the Alpha Kappa Alphas, the Sigma Gamma Rose, those Greek organizations, mm. those were founded, those were those were created in black university and colleges. Because when they freed the slaves, we, we couldn't be educated. So we created our own universities and colleges. So out of those university and colleges, they created these organizations called, and it's called the Divine Nine. There are four, four female and they're called sororities and there are five okay. males, the males okay. are called fraternities. So that's where America's wealth, black America's wealth comes from pretty much from the Divine Nine. Okay. And I know that some of them have chapters in Ghana. Yes, I, I even I even I know one person called um Mandy. Mandy uh came to Ghana with about 60 to 70 women from the Theta Sigma Delta Sigma already something, yeah. something. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I know a little bit about them. Yeah. 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 And then you interviewed you interviewed a queen mother who's a delta. Yeah, she's the she's the one I'm talking about. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so, um, so that's that's America's wealth, black wealth, black America's wealth mm. comes from those organizations. Those are also the same people that come to 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 um, Afro Future every year and the Black mm -hmm. Starline Festival every year. That because you know those tickets are pretty pretty pricey for that event, right? The average Ghanaian can't afford them kind of tickets. I know they be getting them though. They they work it out somehow, but but that's you know four hundred dollars for a ticket. That's a lot of money for a ticket. That's that's rent for some people for a whole year, right? So, but that's who keeps showing up in Ghana. That's who's coming there and, and setting up a, a lot of the businesses and, and and buying those houses. That now some of them are the same price as the houses in my in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> so now we we get in Clara with the misinformation that was imprinted in our minds. Yeah. Now, the question is that, what can I do? What can you do? What can the African diaspora community, what can Africans here, what can we do together in order to change the narrative? What can we do? And then if you may wanna add exactly what you are, because I know I see a lot of things you're doing, you're moving around African countries, doing what you have to do. First of all, what can we do together and what are you also doing so that other people can look at it and duplicate? Then we would have a lot of development here in Ghana or in Africa. Sure, sure. Well, yeah. So, you know, again, I've been at this for about 14 years and I've, I've taken time. I've done research. I've learned. I have built a community in Ghana before I even touched ground there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important because the culture is so different. And, you know, coming from the West, we're, we're used to, to a certain way of life. Uh, we're used to a certain structure. We're used to certain processes in, in the business sector, uh, even just in everyday life, in, in, in our routine. And you may not, you, you, you won't find that necessarily in Ghana so easily. Mm -hmm. But what helped me was I built a relationship with this family before I even came on my first trip. Right. Because it's because in America, we live in what's called individuality. You can live next door to your neighbor for 40 mm -hmm. years and not mm -hmm. know who your neighbor is. 
you don't have that in Ghana. In Ghana, everything is is community. We don't really have communities like what's like like what's on the continent. And so, but in order to to interact, in order to be a part of that society, we have to become community community oriented. We have to build those relationships. Those relationships will save you a lot of headache and frustration because the locals know the process and you don't mm -hmm. coming from the West. And so I've really learned to lean on my Ghanaian family that I've built, my Ghanaian circle. And then coming with an open mind because it's not America. Uh, I can't come to Africa and look for American food. Um, I've seen some YouTubers, they moved to, to Ghana and they complain, I can't find this particular American food that I'm used to eating, or I can't find that. Well, you, you're not in America, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Now granted, you can probably find it, but if you find it, it's gonna cost you a whole lot because it has to be imported. And so, um, so being more open-minded and then understanding that the diaspora has the capital but the Ghanaians or the African continent really doesn't like we have it. And so understanding that my responsibility coming from the diaspora is to, to, bring, is to bring the capital to the table, not just capital, but bring my intellectual properties, the expertise that I've gotten from working for the State Department all those years and program and project management, that's still useful in Ghana. But how I implement it is different than how I implemented it here. Mm -hmm. because there they may not be so well versed in those principles, mm -hmm. but it's my job to share and educate and bring things along and not be frustrated in bringing the, the, the African community along with me. But it's, right. it's about sharing the knowledge and educating and training because I find that, that um, especially Ghanaians, Gha Ghanaians are so easy. <laughs> They're so easy, so kind, so sweet. So, you know, and so it's not really difficult to, uh, th they're excited just that we're there, you know, mm -hmm. and they're ready and they're eager, but you just have to manage the process with patience mm -hmm. and care, and understanding that because of both of us have had trauma from colonialism, but our traumas are different. The tactic was the same, divide and conquer, but the trauma that happened was different. I'm carrying trauma from my ancestors who came on that boat across the Atlantic and were slaves. My family were slaves in, in South Carolina. And so, um, and so that, but through but, but, but trauma is carried through DNA until you heal it. But if you don't know you need healing, then you don't know you need healing. So you can't heal it. So recognizing that, oh, I'm still carrying trauma, that's, that's, that's part of the healing. You're halfway there. And then you do the work to, um, uh, to, to, to allow the healing to happen. But connecting with the continent is another part of the healing. You can never be fully healed if you don't make that connection. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to live on a continent, but you have to at least make the connection and connect with, with the motherland or as in Burkina Faso, they call it the fatherland, but to make that connection. And so um, when I came on that first trip, the moment I stepped on the ground, I felt different. And I knew something was happening in me. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that that some healing was taking place, and I didn't. And even though that's been been, been uh, ten years ago now, almost ten years, I don't I don't even know the depth of the healing that occurred from mm -hmm. that first trip. But since then, a, additional healing has occurred. Some of it I am aware of because I've purposely um, done healing exercises to foster more healing, right? Mm -hmm. And I've done the research. I've studied. I've learned. And I'm continually feeding myself and learning. And I'm always learning something new, right? And so, um, 
So in and 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 then what I when I learned, I share it with my team because again, I have mm-hmm. a team there of about twenty people on the ground. Mm-hmm. So when I started the business three three years ago, uh, I I took the risk. Now all the people that work for me, they're good people. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're trustworthy people. They are loyal. You know, and Ghanaians tend to be loyal to a fault, right? But um, I developed, I handpicked everybody. Some of them, I just saw them online. And I said, I think this person should work for me. And I called them up and had a conversation. And without fail, everybody I chose fits so well. And I've had no issues with anybody in three years. Now, there are some people that I've dealt with that don't work for me that I've had issues with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. I've lost quite, I lost about maybe about $10,000 total in dealing with different people for different things that I did. But I didn't allow that to discourage me because I knew it's a part of the process. I knew that I was learning in it. I don't consider it a mistake that I lost $10,000. I consider it was a lessons learned. Right. And then the flip side of that is Ghana's been good to me. Right. If you knew what Ghana has done to replace that $10,000, then you wouldn't be complaining. (laughs) (laughs) You wouldn't be complaining. So it takes work, but it's doable. And we have to do the work. Right. Because nobody is coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. And in saving ourselves, we have to be patient with each other. And of course, again, I set up a business, I hired people, and we haven't really, since three years ago when I set the business up, we really haven't, we haven't done, I shouldn't say we haven't done work. We've been doing groundwork. Mm-hmm. So there's no, um, right now, there's no tangible evidence of the work. Yeah other than the places that we've been, the pictures that we've taken, the events that we've shared. Uh, we've made a lot of memories and I've built a team, but the team is putting the organizational structure in place. Mm-hmm. And now it's, it's it, we're there. So now it's time to build on that, but putting some structures on, uh, putting some practical things in practice. Yeah, yeah. Now let's come to the, the basic thing that I want us to talk about, which is um, the project that you are doing right now called the Wakanda Enterprise or the tour that is coming to Ghana. Okay. I know next year um, you're planning of bringing a quiet number of African diaspora to Ghana. Tell us a little bit about this. Give us all the details so that anybody who is watching us right now would say, hey, Echo, um, can we put my name down? I want to join this trip and then make it to the motherland. So uh, sure. within the time left, just tell us, Give us all the information that we need. Okay, sure. So because of my experience with Ghana and then my experience here with the diaspora, so many people, they they have misconceptions about what Africa is because we've all been lied to. I mean, let's face it. And so I decided because of my experience, actually, I've written down the experiences that I've had. And I want because mm-hmm. I wanted to share them with the diaspora. So um, then I decided uh, earlier this year, I'm, I was talking to a friend of mine. Her name is Aku, and um, she's Togolese, but she lives here. We were mm-hmm. talking. I said, you know what? I want to do a tour to West Africa. She said, I've been thinking about the same thing. I said, well, let's make it happen. So in yeah. January, we were talking about it. And that's where Wakanda Group's tours was birthed. And um so we decided let's do Ghana since Ghana pretty much is is my home base. I said, but we'll we'll do a, a side trip to Togo so that some people can have this experience two West African countries in one trip. You know, I I wanted to build the trip around diasporans to villages because there are a lot of diasporans who come to Ghana and they they come to Accra and that's it. They may go to Cape Coast to go to the, the, the slave dungeons and see that or Almina, that kind of thing. But they don't really go to the village. And it's in the villages that the, the villages need more economic development and opportunities than Accra itself. Not to, to, to slight Accra, but um, 
So I decided, I said, I, I wanted to do tours and I wanted to take people to the village. So let them see what the village is. Now, in America, we have sort of what's called the village, but we don't call it the village. We call it the country. Country, okay. And so there are rural areas that are sparsely populated. And like for me, my grandparents lived in the country. So when I was a young boy, we used to go to the country during the summers to see my grandparents. And in the country, you you had a house that had, had didn't have indoor plumbing. You got your water from a well. You either had a well in the front of the house or on the side of the house or the back of the house. And you'd have to go to get well water every day. You had to bathe in a tub. You pour the water in the tub. Um, to, to light the stove, you used wood and you lit the wood and you cooked, right? And so it was the country. It was the village. That was how the village, that's how the village is, right? In, 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 in Africa. So I wanted to take people into the village and then I wanted to set up programs to help the village. So the tour that I'm doing is, it's it's a combination of healing. Um, there is a, a woman, she she lived in California for a number of years. Um, she's Ghanaian. She has a healing center in Accra mm -hmm. called Ahota. Uh, her name is Akungwa Hima. And so she's partnered with us. Um, when So we have four locations that we'll hit, and those locations are across different regions in Ghana. We're coming to Accra, of course, because the airport is there. We'll stay um, three days or so at uh, Ahota uh, with uh, Akongwahima. And then we'll go from there to probably to uh, Bunri. And Bunri I have a special relationship with because I'm in the process of being installed in Bunri. And so... Uh, I was in Bunri. Uh, I've been to Bunri a couple of times. I went back in May where I had my naming ceremony. So that's why you see uh, Nana Kwa on the screen. So I'm Nana Kwa, Nana Kwabena Ababiu. Um, <clears throat> but I'm doing some unique things in Bunri. Uh, and I'm talking with my Paramount about land to do building. Uh, I also have partnered with another Ghanaian who lives here in my area who does agro. He's got an agro product. So he he called me and says, hey, you're doing housing. He said, let's partner. He says, I do agro and I do investments with the diaspora in Ghana. He said, I, I, I want to do housing, but I, I didn't have anybody or don't have that piece in place. But since you do it, let's do a collaboration. So I'm collaborating with him. Uh, his name is uh, Nana Obin. Uh, he's in his, his, his agro product is called Acres. And so... Um, I'm 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 a, I'm going to acquire land in 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 Bonry for farming. We're going to start farming, uh, and then we're going to use his product for the farming. I'm going to build houses, very affordable housing for the diaspora, so that they can come and they can be in the village and on the farm to see the farming process. Um, and then we're we'll, we're going to go to uh, to to the central region to the Pan African village because that's another um, lovely aspect of the diaspora coming to, to, to Ghana in that in the Pan-African village, Nana Okotachi has set aside 5,000 acres of land for the diaspora. And so that land is not really getting a lot of attention. So I wanna bring some emphasis and focus on the Pan-African village. Uh, I was there in May and uh, they've currently got somewhere a little over 300 families that have plots there and have built houses there, but there's no businesses in place. There is land in that 5,000 acre community for businesses. So when I come back on this next trip, which will be in December, uh, I've been talking with the administrative office there. I'm going to get some of the, the business uh, land and start setting up businesses. Uh, I wanna meet with the community to find out out of those 300 or so families that have plots and they built houses there, what business ideas do they have and do they want to implement? And then I'm going to build them for them, mm -hmm. set up their shop, their space, whatever it is, so that we can start building a commerce community. And then the goal is to en engage the locals in the area to come and provide jobs for them so that they can work and so they can run the businesses that we set up. Mm -hmm. right? um, and then 
uh, we're also going to go to Togo. But in every location, so even in the Pan-African village, when I speak with the, the leadership there, not only am I going to get, I want to get some commercial land, I want the, they also have land for a garden or for farming. So I want to get that land too and start the farming mm -hmm. so that that community can have their own produce. And then we can start setting up our own market in the Pan-African village. Mm -hmm. And, and then we can bring the locals in to do the farming. So to continue with creating jobs. I mean, I have I have um, a, a huge vision for the Pan-African Village. Uh, and it's a vision that um, that I had really kind of came together some four or five years ago when uh, Nana Okotachi and a delegation from Ghana came to D.C. or to New York to talk about 5,000 acres and how that program would work. And so when they came, I was at, I went to New York. I was a part of the program. I asked, I volunteered myself to help them because I, I knew that you need capital if you're going to do these projects. And, and that's the whole purpose of kind of engaging the diaspora to come to help develop Ghana. And so, um, so I had met with Nana Okotachi about some of those ideas that I had, and he was on, he was on board with it. So it's finally coming to fruition. We're finally at a point where I can start implementing some of those things. And so there are huge business opportunities for any diaspora who wants to, first of all, come to the Pan-African Village and build a house, uh, but we're setting up the community where you can have storefront property to sell whatever product that you wanna sell. And some of the, and, and, and in, in the village, that'll be the last stop on my 14 day tour. But the, the, the day before we leave, we'll also have an investment seminar so we'll have speakers come and talk about we'll have the representatives talking about the pan-african village and how you can get your, your your plot so you can build there uh i've got somebody who will come in and talk about um fish farm um i've got other builders coming in to talk about building houses um we had our first ghana real estate expo here in in the dc area about a month ago and all of these ghanaian developers came from ghana and they got to share about um, the communities, the, the the areas where they build, the communities that they're establishing, um, how financing works, how um, with 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 the banks, how financing works with the developers themselves. It's not like our system, so they were coming to to bring knowledge and understanding uh, about how to build. And really, their target audience were the Ghanaians who have repatriated to the U.S. who live here and mm -hmm. not the African-American diaspora who lives here, though it, it was open to them, but it was really targeting the Ghanaian com community because what, what happens with the Ghanaian community when they come here, they send money back home to build a house, their house don't get built, <laughs> right? Even if it's a family member handling the finances. So what, they, what, what this gentleman who set this process up decided to do is he said, I'm gonna set up a network where you can send your money home to a trustworthy group who's going to help build what you want built. So your money will be safe and you can get whatever you want to build and not have to trust your money with people, whether it's family or friends, and not get anything for all the money you've sent home. Right. So I've met some of those developers and I've connected with them. So I'm going to invite them to the seminar too, so they can talk about you know, how, how, how they can help build housing in that community as well. Uh, and then we're going to go to Togo. Uh, and so we're going to go to Palime. I don't know how familiar with Togo you are, but there's a waterfall in Palime. Uh, one of my employees, has he's Togolese. He's got property in Palime. So we're talking about building a like an Airbnb in Palime because Palime is the place where people get away to on the weekends and there's not mm -hmm. a lot of housing there. So those are just a few of the things that I'm doing and there's so much more. Um, but to kind of to, to, to give an idea to your audience, uh, there are plenty of opportunities. I mean, I welcome the diaspora to come and work with me because I've got plenty going on, not just in Ghana, but I have a huge, a massive project getting ready to pop off in Burkina Faso. And I don't know if any, uh, uh, I'm sure some of your, your, your viewers have been following Captain Ibrahim Traore and what's going on there, but I was a part of um, Dr. Arakana's team. I'm, I'm a part of her organization. 
So I was a part of a team of 150 delegates who went to Burkina Faso back in May. And we got to meet the president, President Ibrahim Traore. We had a private session with him. We got to meet a number of his cabinet members. And a number of us came away from Burkina Faso with jobs. Mm. And so I have a huge, huge building project there. And so I'm going to need a lot of help. And so I, in, I invite the diaspora, come, come to Africa. There's plenty of opportunities. And not just in what I'm doing, though I can help connect you to opportunities because of my vast network, but even the stuff that I'm doing is going to need a lot of diaspora support. Right. And the goal is let's build the Africa that we want because it's a clean slate. It's virgin land. And we can do it however we want to do it. Listen, when is the when is the event? When is the trip? Oh, so the one exact date. So the tour is April nineteenth uh, mm -hmm. through May third, twenty twenty five. Um, we leave again. We, we, so we'll, we'll, we'll land in Ghana. We'll again, we'll, we, we land in Accra. That's the first stop. And, um, uh, it's all inclusive. Um, okay. the trip is $3,800. Mm -hmm. The only thing that is not included are the two visas, your Ghanaian visa and your Togolese visa. Okay. I do have contacts at the Ghanaian embassy here who, um, I'll take, because the embassy is right here in my area, so I'll, I'll I'll hand walk them in, give them to my contact. He'll process them. I'll come and pick them up, bring them back, and disperse them to the, anybody who goes on the trip. As far as Togo is concerned, I also have the Togolese contact here at the embassy. So uh, I'll work out arrangements to get everybody. I already have my Togo visa uh, as well as my Ghana visa, but uh, I'll work with him to get the visas for everybody so that um, people don't have to worry about, well, I got to send my passport in mm -hmm. and, and then mm -hmm. I got to wait. No, no, I'll hand carry it in for you so that we can get them back and get them back to you. Um, and so everything is included. Um, we have a motor coach that will carry us throughout each region, even over into Togo. Um, we will and we've got housing. Our housing will be, for the most part, except in Accra where we'll stay at uh, Ohota. The other places we stay will be more like Airbnbs. Mm. But in the Pan-African village in particular, we'll, you'll get to stay in the village where your plot is and you'll get to meet people who are gonna be your neighbors if you get a plot. Right. A lot of those people who have houses um, in the Pan-African village, they've set them up as Airbnbs. And so, and of course you've interviewed a number of them and, and, and showcase them on your platform. Uh, Namoy, she's a sweetheart. Uh, Mr. Lin, um, he, he's something else, but <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's a good dude. Uh, Ron, uh, I've met um, uh, Steve, Steve Coakley. I mean, beautiful people. And they're all right there. They all have uh, Airbnbs. And so we're going to stay in their property so you get to stay on site and you can see what the potential is for what you could do once you build your space if you wanted to do something like that. All right. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. So I think this is going to be one of the best trips. If you've never been to the motherland, you should take this trip. You know, go come back and learn something more, something different. Be refreshed with your mentality about Africa and Africans. So uh, I want to thank you, Nanakwa Abebio, for uh, being on my channel. It's been a great conversation. And I know anybody who is watching now, putting up their comment, would also say that this has been a great conversation. Before you go, what is your last word for anybody who is watching us right now? Don't believe the lies they've told you about Africa. Go to Africa and see for yourself. <laughs> Period. Thank you very much for being on my channel.